morning, Sunny Lane. Woo! Are you guys excited to be in the house of the Lord? Man, I tell you, God has got something great planned this morning. Anytime we can gather in his name, we know God is going to be there. I'm excited. Oh, you guys are not near as excited as I am. I need you guys to get on board with this. You got, I got all this room up here to jump around now. I'm not going to say I'm going to, but I have that opportunity. I have that option. And guess what? I'm so excited in the Lord, I just might do it. Are you guys ready to worship? Because I can tell you this, there ain't no grave that's going to hold that body down because our God rose from the grave. Our God, the only person to ever be on this earth, pull himself out of that grave and save us all. Amen. Are you guys excited? Amen. Are you guys excited? Let's worship. Well, there ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Come on. There ain't no, no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear the trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as the grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. Fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant, he's always telling me to run. Love is a resurrection, love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon, I'm gonna take my giants down. There ain't no grave. trumpet sound gonna rise up out of the ground there ain't no Like a lion, now he's setting all the captives free. There ain't no grave to hold his body down. the grave I'm walking to. You walked out of the grave I'm walking to. Come on, church. You walked out of the grave I'm walking to. You walked out of the grave I'm walking to. I'm following Jesus, y'all. You, you walked, walked out, out of the grave, grave I'm walking, walking to. to. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. 
If you walk out of a grave, I'll walk in too. If you walk out of a grave, I'll walk in too. There ain't no grave. Who hold your body down? There ain't no grave. trumpet sound oh, I'm gonna, gonna rise up, up out, out of the ground There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Well, aren't you thankful today for the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Man, I'm so thankful for that today. And listen, we're up here this morning because we get to celebrate two souls that have been resurrected in life in Jesus Christ that have been born again. Amen. Katrina, come on down. Everybody welcome Katrina Faircloth to the baptistry. We praise the Lord for Katrina. And I got to tell you, this is an amazing story. Miss Teresa has been ministering to Katrina. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens even outside the church. In other words, sometimes folks don't know, but, you know, we, we have times where people get saved, not just in this building, but they get saved uh, outside this church. And so that's what it's supposed to be. Amen. And so Miss Teresa has been ministering to Katrina. And then I got to tell you, this dear sister, she realized that she was lost. She needed a Savior, and she realized that she needed to surrender to be born again. And Katrina, I'm going to ask you, did you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. She wants to follow the Scriptures and be baptized to show it. All right. Amen. Okay, Miss Katrina, you can have a seat. Because of your profession of faith to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's my blessing, my honor to baptize you, my new sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of His death. Raised in the likeness of His resurrection. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's welcome Bentley Lock to the baptistry. All right? Everybody welcome this young man. Bentley, you can stand right here. Come stand right over here. He's got a sprained ankle. So he hurt his ankle, so he came up here on crutches. And so, man, that's awesome for a young man like that, that trusted Christ, wants to get baptized, sprained ankle or not, he came to church to get baptized. Y'all, some, some of y'all need to hear that, amen? Now, Bentley, let me ask you something. I think it was at Falls Creek, right? Did you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be born again? Yes. Amen. Yes, he did. Praise the Lord for Bentley, all right? Bentley, right? Okay, let me baptize you. All right, Bentley, put your hand there. Okay, look up at me. All right, because of your profession of faith to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's my blessing to baptize you, my new brother in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. Well, I would say that's a pretty good way to start off Sunday morning service. Amen. We're so glad you're here this morning. We want you to know that if you are a first-time guest, we're glad to have you. If you have an opportunity, if you look in front of you, there's a little white card. It literally says Sunny Lane Baptist Church. And so if you would, grab that card. Fill that out at the very end of our service. We, we encourage you to go to our Connect team. We have a Connect Center. If you walk right down this middle aisle, you'll turn to the right. You'll see a center there. Turn that card in. We'd love to see you. We've got a special gift we'd love to give you. We'd love to be a blessing for you also. There's a prayer request we can pray for you. Turn that card over on the back, write it on the back, put it on the uh, on the buckets there where it says tithes and offerings, and we can minister to you as a staff. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's invite the presence of God into this place, and let's ask Jesus to fill our minds and our hearts with Him today. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you this time. We give you this hour. Lord, we ask for your anointing and your blessing and your power. 
to be displayed today in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's worship the Lord. All right, join us as we continue to worship. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. No shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Amen. a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red sin wash away I owe all to you I owe all to you Jesus there's a place where sin and shame are powerless peace with God and forgiveness where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you, where your love ran red and my sin washed away, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, here my hope is found, here on holy ground, here I bow down. Bow down here, arms open wide. Here, you save my life. Here, I bow down. Here, I bow at the cross. At the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed away. I owe all to you. 
I owe all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed away, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. Jesus. Y'all ever had one of those days where nothing's going right? Where Satan is just throwing every bad that he has? It's a it's something amazing that we can rest in the fact that God's goodness is exponentially greater than whatever bad he can give us, whatever Satan can give us. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, running after me Your goodness is running after, running after me with my life laid down i'm surrendered now i give you everything your goodness is running after running after me oh, your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after running after with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing I'm gonna sing oh. your goodness is running after running after me your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your 
goodness is running after, running after. is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered, now I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. you believe that, say amen. amen. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look absolutely marvelous this morning. Would you do that? And then look at him and say, you are super blessed to be sitting next to me. Super blessed. Come on, say that. You're super blessed to be sitting next to me. Amen? Well, that's some of you. Okay, all right. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Daniel chapter 6. I've been preaching a series of messages to you on Sunday morning out of the book of Daniel. Let me just remind you again what it's about, all right? Let's don't, let's don't forget this. We're calling it Confronting the Culture. And so what we're learning how to do as New Testament believers, we're learning to look at the life of Daniel and to study his life and really the life of his friends and really look and see what he's done to stand against the tides of unbelief. He's standing against a world that really, for the most part, does not believe in God. I mean, we know that through the Babylonians and now the Medes and the Persians. And so I think it's a message for us in this 21st century. I said I believe it's a message for us in this 21st century, how we are to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ in a world that does not believe in God, in a world that opposes God for the most part, and in a world that stands against the Word of God. You say, Pastor, how do I do it? How can I, how can I live for Jesus in this world? It's just getting so tough. Well, I believe God's got these words for us right here. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to begin to read in verse 1. I'm preaching this morning on this subject, walking with the giants. Walking with the giants. Daniel chapter 6, I'll read verse 1. Now let me remind you what's taking place here. In the context of Scripture, there's a transition that's taken place here from the Babylonian Empire to the Medes and the Persian Empire. Now we've come to the place where the Medes and the Persians are now in control, and Daniel's still there. And so there's a new king, there's a new leader, and his name is Darius. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, if you're ready to receive God's Word, say amen. amen. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give an account unto them. In other words, that, that they're going to have to answer to them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents. That phrase literally means he was distinguished above the presidents and princes because, now listen to this, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king fought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Now, now, that literally means that they're trying to find some faults against Daniel. So, so these other people that are leaders in leadership with him are trying to find a reason, an occasion to find a fault against him. They're trying to find grounds to, to challenge his conduct with government affairs. So the Bible says, then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom... But they could find no occasion nor fault. 
For as much as, as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days except of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not, it cannot be revoked. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. Has thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into a den of, a den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, he was sore displeased within himself. That literally means he's deeply troubled and broken. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king, and they said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Father, you've given us some amazing truths today. And Lord, I pray that they won't be truths that we just will hear with our ears, but Lord, we'll hear them with our hearts. Lord, I'm praying today for an anointing and a power that only you can give me to preach today. Lord, I'm asking for the double portion of your power and anointing by your Spirit to preach your Word. God, I pray that we won't play church today. And I, play we, I pray we don't play games with you today. And I pray that we will respect and honor the Word of God. Not Brother Danny, but the Word of God. Your Word. And that we will be spellbound by it. And God, I'm praying that we'll see an outpouring of your spirit today to see lives changed forever. And in your kingdom, we, we just ask that. In the mighty, powerful name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, let me remind you, in Daniel chapter 5, we see the end of the kingdom of Babylonian. The Babylonian kingdom. Now we come to chapter 6 and it begins with really the organization of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians that have really overcome ancient Babylon. Just as Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that his kingdom, which was the head of gold, would give way to the next kingdom, which was represented by the Medes and the Persians, God's word came to pass. It happened exactly like God said it was going to happen. And it's so amazing that through all that, now listen, through all that, that the one person that's still standing when the dust is settled is Daniel, the man who knew the one true God of the ages, the God of the Holy Bible. Daniel is truly a giant of the faith. Now, man's work ceases. And an evil man's work is done with, but God's work, it continues on. And God certainly has a work for his prophet by the name of Daniel. Now, now notice here at the writing of these words in the sixth chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel is what we would call a senior saint. 
He he was probably in his 80s. He's come to that place here being in captivity for quite some time, for close to 70 years now. And Daniel really reminds me, as I just see him standing and thriving, having survived the fall of one kingdom and the beginning of another, he reminds me of that story that Jesus talked about in the book of Matthew chapter 7, where he talked about a man that was a, that was a, a very wise man. And remember, he said he built his house upon a rock. He built his life upon the rock, and the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that Jesus said the floods came, and the rains fell, And the winds blew up and battered that house, but that house did not fall because that house was established on the rock. Daniel founded his life on God. Daniel established and centered his life on God and on his word. The storms came, the floods rose, the winds blew, but his life did not crumble because he was standing on the rock of ages, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just see here that his testimony did not fade because he was a man that stood on the rock. Now, Daniel is is what I would call a giant of the faith. He, He is what I would call a spiritual giant. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know today that God wants all of us today as New Testament believers to be spiritual giants. God has not called you to be some humdrum believer that sort of tips your hat to God every once in a while and you just go on and you don't have the power of God in your life. No, I'm telling you, God wants His people today to be spiritual giants. He wants you, sir, to be a spiritual giant. He wants you, ma'am, to be a spiritual giant. He wants you, young people, to be spiritual giants. God does not want people to be weak. God does not call his believers to be weak in this world. Folks, if there's anything that we need in America today, that's some spiritual giant believers in the kingdom of God. And so I just believe one of the ways that you can become a giant of the faith is just really to observe and emulate those people that God used in a special way. So here's what I want to do. I want to walk today with this spiritual giant named Daniel. I just want to kind of look at his life and analyze him for just a minute. We've looked a lot about him, but I just want to look here and see this man that I would say is a spiritual giant. Now I want you to notice with me that there's three things in these first 15 verses that I want you to notice about Daniel. Notice with me, first of all, I want you to see something about his influence. His influence. Now follow this. Daniel had an influence in Babylon. He he is a believer in a kingdom where there are no believers. And now he's got tremendous influence among the Medes and the Persians who were also idol worshipers. Are you getting that? He's living in a kingdom for the most part, that does not know God. But he's got tremendous influence with lost people. Now notice what the Bible says in verse 1. It's right here. It pleased Darius to set him over the kingdom of 120 princes. Now now that that literally means a Persian official. So, So it's an official name of a Persian government or a governor, I guess you could say. It's a person that I guess you could say is over a republic or a state or a, or a segment of society. And so when this king of Persia was organizing his kingdom, he organized it around these 120 men. Follow this. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, governors, which should be over the whole kingdom. Now, Notice, he wants somebody to supervise these 120, so he puts these three presidents over these princes, over these officials, and what's amazing is, now listen, what's amazing is this, Daniel, who was not a Babylonian, who was not a Persian, he sets him over this tremendous position of influence and authority. Notice what it says in verse 2, it says, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no 
damage or, or, or no loss. And so, so Daniel was supervising Persians as a Hebrew, a man brought as a slave from Judea by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, folks, this is what we would call the providence of God. That this is what we would call the sovereignty of God, the omnipotence and the, and the almightiness of God Almighty. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you again that life is not filled with chance. Life is not filled with some that would call faith. Life is controlled by a holy God who, who allows all things to work together for your good. Life is controlled by a holy God and even allows that what you deem as bad that works together for your good. God Almighty is Lord of the disappointments and God Almighty is the Lord of the appointments. God Almighty is the Lord of absolutely everything. Now you got to get this. Understand this, what's happening here. You have to understand that God has promised the nation of Israel, Israel, that they're going to regather again in the Holy Land. Listen, God has promised them that they were going to rebuild the temple again. They're going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now that's, that's coming. That time is coming. It hasn't happened yet, but we know by studying the Bible that that's coming. I mean, they've been in exile now for 70 years. It's approaching, and so God has already written the future. And just as we look at the past and study future and study history, understand that God writes the future, guys. And it is as good as done. So, so here's what's happening. Don't, don't miss this. God is, is orchestrating the circumstances here. He's moving the circumstances around here, and, and he's positioning Daniel so that when the Spirit of God moves on the heart of this king and sends Israel back, to their holy land, that Daniel is already there in that strategic position. He's already there in place. Why? Because God is working all things together for his good. You, you know, guys, it's really an amazing thing how sometimes God will, will, a holy God on occasion, he will promote a godly man or, or a godly woman to a position of, of influence and authority. In leadership positions, in, in the world, in your job, in, in situations, maybe even in ministry. I mean, just in the world. See, God, God will do that. He'll promote you maybe to a position of influence or, or, or just a place on the job. I mean, I'm just saying, guys, God has a way of engineer, engineering circumstances so that a man or a woman of God is in that position of influence for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Let's get to the nitty-gritty here, all right? Are y'all with me? Some of y'all don't like your job right now. Yeah, some of you aren't happy with where your lot is in life. Some, some of you, man, you just think, man, I don't know why I'm here. I, I can't stand my job. I can't stand my boss. He's a dirt bag. He's, no, he's mean. He's hard. I, I don't like where I'm at. I don't like the people that I'm around with. Man, God, if you can just get me out of here and get me to a new job, then I promise I serve you. No, you need to understand that God has strategically put you there for a reason. God's got you where you are right now, maybe in your circumstance, maybe in that situation, maybe even in your life that you don't like. That, that thing that's painful, that thing that's happening in your life that's causing you pain and, 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 and trouble. Listen, God's got you there Amen. for a reason because he's God. He has put you in that position. And so for those of you that don't like where you're at, whether it's at school, whether it's on the job, whether it's wherever you are, then you need to understand that God has put you there to be an influence. Amen. And can I just remind you, when God guides, God provides. Never, ever forget that. Amen. And so the providence of God and the sovereignty of God, it really has everything to do with Daniel here. I mean, come on, he's the right man for the right place, and God puts him there. But notice with me Daniel's spirit. 
You, you see, he's the kind of man that God can use. Notice what it says in verse 3. Don't miss this verse, man. It says, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes. And, and that word preferred is translated distinguished. So, so Daniel is distinguished. He's, listen, he's distinguished himself above all these other people here, these other presidents. He's distinguished himself above all these other 120. And the Bible says all of them. He's distinguished himself above those other people. And so here's what happens. The king begins to take notice of him. And he says, man, there's something different about that guy. Because notice what the Bible says in verse 3. It says, because an excellent spirit was in him. That, that literally means an extraordinary spirit. Read this again, verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred, he was distinguished above all the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king, look at this, the king thought to set him over the whole realm. The king actually gave thought of setting him over the whole shebang. Isn't that an amazing thought? I mean, the king, the Persian king, this Persian king who didn't even know God was so amazed by the spirit and the work ethic and the attitude of Daniel, and he didn't even know Daniel's God. He was so impressed with Daniel, he thought, man, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to put him over the whole thing. I am so impressed with how he handles things because there's an excellent spirit in him. Now let's talk about this excellent spirit. Well, what is this thing that the Bible's talking about when it says an excellent spirit? I mean, what does that mean? Well, well, I just think we can compare it to today as New Testament Christians. Where a man, his inner man, a man or a woman, their inner man is controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's what I believe can be translated there as an excellent spirit. See, a man or a woman, their inner person is controlled by the Holy Spirit. And listen, that spirit begins to manifest itself in your conduct and in your conversation. Now, now just think about this. When, when a believer is controlled by the Holy Spirit, they're going to bear fruit. Let me say that again. If you're a believer, if you're saved, the Bible says you're going to bear fruit. And Jesus says, if you don't have any fruit, then you're not even his. You're not even saved. See, a lot of people say, well, Brother Danny, don't judge anybody. No, Jesus says we're to judge him by the fruits. If there's no fruits in their life, man. Listen, something's not right. But, but listen, if you're saved today, you're going to bear fruit. That's just evidence that you're saved. The Bible says it's love, it's joy. Come on, read it. Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, meekness, temperance, self-control. I mean, think about all that. And let me say this, a person who is controlled by the Spirit of God is going to have agape, sacrificial love. That's what that word love is. So that means they're going to be helpful. That means they're going to go the extra mile. I mean, that's what's going to set them apart from everybody else. So, so here is a man that is possessed by the agape, sacrificial love of God, which one day is going to cause the Father to send His only begotten Son to die for the sins of the world. Amen. He's possessed by the agape love of God. Here is a man who has a cheerful spirit. Here is a man who has a good attitude. Church, here is somebody that is fun to be around. You know, uh, <laughs> you're not going to like this. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not going to like this. You know, some people do a job well, but they do it with the wrong attitude. Some, some people, they'll, they'll do things well as far as the job performance, but their attitude stinks. And they don't do it for the right reason or, or the right motives. I mean, some people do what they're employed to do, but they whine and gripe all the time. Even God's people will do that in the church. Can you believe that? Isn't that just an, an astounding? I can't even believe that. 
Pastor, you mean to tell me that God's people in the church will serve as volunteers and work in the children's ministry or the student ministry or any other kind of ministry, and sometimes they'll gripe and complain the whole time? You mean to tell me that really happens? Yeah. I'm just saying, we're just getting quiet in here, man. Woo! I'm, we're getting to where we need to be. I'm just telling you, man, here's a guy who, who I want you to see is a, is a spiritual giant. I want you to understand somebody that's a spiritual giant. Guys, here's a man that's filled with love. Here's a man that's filled with joy. Here's a man that's filled with peace. Here's a man that's filled with patience. Here's a man who's flexible. Here's a man who doesn't pout, he doesn't frown, he doesn't gripe, he doesn't complain. He is a spiritual giant. And man, I, I'm just telling you, just, just walking through life, man, he's going through life and people just say, man, there's something different about that guy. He has an excellent spirit. So I want to challenge every believer in this church today to get filled with the Holy Spirit of God and let that Spirit of God become to be manifested in your life. And listen, when you're out there on the job, that boss or that person you work with can say, man, I don't, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. But there is something different about that guy. That's who Daniel was, a spiritual giant. Now follow this. When the king said he was impressed with Daniel, now get this. When he said, I am impressed with this man named Daniel, and I'm going to promote him. When the king said that, that's when Daniel got in trouble. Amen. And that's what caused these other two people to, to connive and seek to undo him. Notice what it says in verse 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find an occasion against him. Again, that means to, to find grounds for, for charges against his conduct in government affairs. That they've sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning his kingdom so so i just want to warn you guys when you step out from the crowd and you surrender yourself totally to god and you and god begins to use you not everybody's going to like it Amen. when you're really going to step out and be that dynamic believer that god wants you to be when you're going to be that spiritual giant not everybody's going to like it Amen. you see folks there's this little thing called jealousy right and and jealousy will grab a hold of your life. Je jealousy will, will literally be like a, like a snake that bites you and won't let go. And so, I mean, here you are today. God's blessing your teaching. God's blessing your ministry. God's blessing your witness. God's blessing your marriage. God's blessing your work. God's blessing your life. And, and, and man, it's sad that some folks can't stand that you're getting a blessing. And you also want to know what's so sad? Some folks don't necessarily want your blessings. They just can't stand the fact that you got them. And, and so if somebody's jealous over the fact that you're getting blessed, take that as a compliment. Because evidently, there's something that's happening in your life that's so powerful and so supernatural that it's rattling the cage of the carnal, fleshly person that's walking in the flesh, and they can't deal with it because they're dealing with jealousy. Let me preach on jealousy for a minute, because I think we need to right now. Listen, jealousy, understand that it causes you to lose delight. It causes you to lose delight in the Lord. You, you, can't, you can't have the joy of the Lord if you're walking around jealous about somebody. Somebody has something that you don't want, that you want, or, or, or you're mad because of this, and you're on, you're on Facebook, and you're scrolling that page. Somebody posts something, boy, that just makes you so jealous. Look at them. Ah, it, right? Can't have delight. How, can't have the joy of the Lord if you're, if you're jealous. Can't have delight. I'll tell you what else it causes. It causes damage. Some damaging relationships because of jealousy, man. And, and let me say this. Jealousy also makes you difficult. Amen. It, makes you, it makes you a difficult person to be around. When you're jealous. Are we getting where we live here? Jealousy causes disunity in the body of Christ. Takes away your delight in the Lord. Causes damages to relationships. Makes you a difficult person to be around. And it causes you to be disunity in the body of Christ. 
And, and I'll say this. Really, the problem with you being jealous is simply this. You're ungrateful Amen. to what the Lord Jesus Christ has given you. Amen. You want what somebody else has. You're mad at what somebody else has. You've got jealousy over what this person has. But here you are. You're un, you, know what you're, you know what you're professing with that wicked jealousy? That you're not happy with what Jesus has given you. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. You listen to your pastor. If you're born again, and if you're saved, if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're not going to go to hell when you die, you've got everything to be grateful about to the Lord Jesus Christ, man. Everything. Jealousy, man. It'll eat you up. And so here's what's happening. These guys get jealous of Daniel. And so what do they want to do? They want to knock him out of his position. So the very first thing I want you to see about this spiritual giant, number one, is I want you to see his influence. But there's a second thing I want you to see about this spiritual giant, and that's just his character. His character. Here, here's what I want to do. I want to take a little deeper look on Daniel on the inside. I want to look at his character. I want to look at his person. Now, now follow this. These, these people that were jealous at him, they, they've decided that they're going to have to dig up some dirt on him. Basically, what they're saying is, is man, if we're going to ruin him, we've got to dig up some dirt on him. And so let, let's try to take him down. Let's bring him down. And so uh, the best way I can describe it, they're kind of like these tabloid reporters, right? They're camping out at Daniel's house. They're watching him. They're trying to find all these things on him. I mean, they're looking everywhere to find some dirt on him. But I want you to notice here that Daniel is clean. The Bible says in verse 4, then the presidents and the princes sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find an occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. So, so get this, after turning over every rock, after looking at every closet, they can't find anything on Daniel. No dirt on Daniel, they just can't find it thank god for a man of character like that thank god for people who are on the outside what they are on the inside thank god for somebody that what you see in public is exactly the way they are in secret you, you see god's looking for people today that just don't act spiritual in public but god's looking for people to act that way in private so how are you acting in private you can come in here and put the mask on. You can come in here and shout amen. You can come in here and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. I'm such a spiritual giant. But let me ask you something. What happens in private? Amen. See, that's what God's looking for when he talks about character. What, what are you like when, when nobody's around? So I love this man. He's clean. They can't find any dirt on him. Man, if God analyzed your life today, can you say the same thing? If some people were trying to find some dirt on you and they hid some cameras in your house or in your car or in your bedroom, students, or, sir, in your office by yourself Amen. in the middle of the night, I mean, listen, and, they're, and they've got a secret camera and they're trying to find dirt on you, some people are trying to do you in. I mean, are they going to are they going to see? Are they going to find anything? Oh, you come, pri hey, publicly, I love Jesus, but privately. He's clean, man. That's character. Amen. If you want to be a spiritual giant, that's what it takes to be a spiritual giant. Amen. But I love this. Not only do we see that he's clean, but they also see that he's committed. Amen. Okay? Amen. He loves his God, man. Follow this. I mean, that's why he had character. They, they, notice they said, man, if we're going to find something to, to criticize, it's going to have to do with his faith. Amen. It's the only, way, the only thing we can find. Verse 5, then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. In other words, the one thing we've noticed watching this guy is he loves his God. Amen. And we've noticed here that he's prayed with his windows open three times a day. So man, we're going to have to connive and figure out a plot because of that, that that will trap him up because of his faith towards God. So, so here's what they do. They're going to set him up. And so what they do is, is they use, now listen, they use two of the oldest weapons in the devil's crowd. 
And the devil still, the devil's crowd still uses those weapons today to cause havoc in the church. Two weapons they use. First of all, lying. Lying. Now, folks, let me remind you that the devil is a liar. And the Bible says that he's the father of all lies. Did you know that, did you know that people will just believe about anything? I mean, they won't research it. They won't look at it. I mean, they'll just believe anything. They'll see something on TV. They'll see something on social media. They'll see something on Facebook or, or Twitter. i got to repost that. Well, have you researched it? I'm just saying people will just believe anything. Folks, can I just tell you something? Check out the facts. Make sure you've got the facts. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. And so the Bible tells us really in verse 6 and 7, I'll just paraphrase this, that these presidents and these governors and these administrators, they go all around and they try to make it out like every single one of them are in agreement with this whole thing. But there is no evidence that they ever actually asked Daniel for his opinion. So what they're saying is not true. They're lying about him. Now, friend, have you ever had anybody lie about you? Let me tell you, if you're going to serve Jesus, that's going to happen. Have you ever had anybody say about something about you that's not true, that you don't believe? Or somebody goes around and starts, starts spreading rumors about you? Man, that just gets you so upset, doesn't it? Man, it makes you mad. You want to you defend yourself. Frank, can I just tell you, man, just relax. As long as you're doing God's work, as long as you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ, as long as you're right with God, let them say whatever they want to say about you. Just, just relax. Understand that God has a way of revealing truth in the very end, and God will expose lies. Just relax and let God take care of it, man. All right? But they're lying. But let me give you the second arsenal that the devil loves to use. Now follow this. There's two things that the devil uses. One of his oldest tricks. Number one, it's lying. And number two, it's flattery. Flattery. Folks, did you know, now listen, did you know that there is a difference between flattery and gossip? Gossip is you saying something about somebody behind their back that you would never say to their face. And flattery is you saying something to their face that you would never say behind their back. That's flattery. i got to repeat that. Y'all get that? Because I know nobody here gossips. All right, forgive me, Lord. Gossip is you saying something about somebody behind their back that you won't say to their face. But flattery is different. Flattery is you'll say something to their face, but you won't say it behind their back. That's flattery. That's what they're doing. Listen, get this. The devil uses flattery. The devil's people use flattery. Look what the Bible says in verse 8. Let me give you a Bible for this. This is in Danny's opinion. Verse 8. Notice, verse 8. Now, O king, established a decree and, and signed the writing that it not be changed. In other words, king, you're infallible. King, you're an errant. Man, you're the man, king. You sign it. You know what they're doing? They're feeding the ego of the king. They're, they're manipulating him with flattery. And so they're like, hey, man, sign the writing, man. That's not changed. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, that it cannot be revoked. Sign it, king. You're the man. You're the dude. You're the only one who can do it, man. And, and then notice, he gets sucked in in verse 9. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Because we know here by studying this, remember, I, didn't, I read that verse at the beginning, but when they find Daniel guilty, the king's broken about it. The Bible says he's so broken about it that he tried to figure out a way to get Daniel off the hook because he was a great influence. So he gets sucked in here to this thing. So, so they trick him with lying and flattery. So, so the Bible tells us something, number one, about Daniel's influence. Listen, a giant of the faith is somebody that is a great influence of the Lord no matter where God puts them. We see something about his character. In other words, a giant of the faith is somebody of character. I mean, somebody that, that has a public life that people see, but not only a public life that's real, but a private life that's real. They've got character. And listen, a person that has character 
And as a giant of the faith, they understand here that people of character are targets of the devil. Friend, can I just tell you something? If you don't ever want to be criticized, don't ever do anything for God, don't ever be anything for God, don't ever attempt anything for God. All right? If you don't want to be criticized, that just comes with it. But notice there's a third thing I want you to see here about the spiritual giant. And that is simply this. I want you to notice his power. I said his power. Now, now this is what I'm trying to zone in on. Think about this. If Daniel could literally survive all that he has survived in Babylon, I mean, from being snatched really out of his parents' hands in captivity and, and has gone all through that he's gone through, through, I mean, if he could survive all of this and literally thrive, then he's got to have the power of God on his life. Now, folks, I believe in, in what is called the old time power of God. That, that word power in the New Testament, when you study that word, it's, it's actually mentioned in the Greek 120 times in the New Testament referring to believers. 120 times. It's the Greek word dunamis, which, which is translated the power of God. Of God now, now, folks. I'm just telling you. I believe that God wants His people to be powerful Christians, not puny Christians. Powerful Christians, somebody that's got God all over them, somebody that is this influence, somebody that's this character, somebody that man goes through this world and you just—it's almost like you can smell it. You almost can just see it on them. It's just the power of God. That's what God wants in this day. That's what we need in our churches today. That's what we need in our country today. We got all these so-called Christians running around saying they're saved and they got no power. God wants his Christians to be dunamis 120 times. It's mentioned in the New Testament. Hey, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, when he was speaking to the church of Corinth, he said, man, I speak not and I don't preach with the wisdom of men in other words, it's not with the cleverness of speech. He says, no, it was a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God, the dunamis of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we see the power of God on the day of Pentecost. We see the power of God when it fell on Mount Carmel. We see the power of God when the people of God prayed back in the books of Acts, and the place was shaken with the manifested power of God. We need people to have the power of God, and Daniel has got the power of God on his life. Let me tell you something, man. Listen, you need the power of God to preach in these worlds today. You need the power of God to teach in this world today. You need the power of God to lead and sing worship today. You need the power of God to minister to the sick. You need the power of God to reach out to the lost. You need the power of God to be the husband that God wants you to be, the spiritual leader that God wants you to be, you need the power of God to be the wife that God wants you to be, the mom that God wants you to be, the student that God wants you to be, the, 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 the adult that God wants you to be, the employee at work that God wants you to be. You need the manifested power unleashed of God upon you in your life. That's the problem today. So you're saying, well, pastor, man, that's great. You're telling me I need the power of God. How do I get it? Well, notice, I'm going to show you how Daniel got it. First of all, he got it through prayer. <laughs> I said prayer. I mean, so, so here's what happens. They basically said, man, they, they've got this decree, okay? You, I love this verse. You, they, they said, you can't pray to any other god and ask for guidance from anyone else except the king of Persia. Verse 7, and all the presidents in the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains, they've consulted together. They had a little me a meeting on the side together to establish this royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days except you, king, you're going to be cast in the den of lions. So, so nobody can pray to any god. Nobody can ask guidance from anybody else except the king of Persia. And so the Bible says, I love this, this is what Daniel did. When he heard about this decree of the king, he didn't say, well, you know, man, it's only 30 days. I'll just hide out for a while. No, he's got to have his prayer time every day. And notice in verse 10, it says that he prays, I love this, with the windows open facing Jerusalem. Now let me say this, there's a lot in that. First of all, he could have prayed 
and closed his windows, right? For the most part, nobody would have saw. But it was his custom to pray with his windows open. His windows open where everybody could see him. Now everybody look at me. You know what he's doing? He's confessing God before men. God has always wanted his people to publicly declare their allegiance to him. God has always wanted his people to publicly declare their faith before the whole world. You see, some of you here today, man, maybe you've made a decision to get saved. Maybe, maybe you've made a profession of faith at one time, but it wasn't the real thing. And now you've made a profession of faith. You got saved maybe in one of our services. Maybe it was at your home or wherever you might have been. But you know what? You've never come down here and made it public. You're out of the will of God. Some of you need to get baptized, scripturally speaking, on the right side of your salvation. But you've never done that. I'm just telling you guys. God has always wanted his people to publicly declare their faith. You know what Moses said one day? He said, everyone who's on my side, come stand with me right here. Jesus said, if you will confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. So I love this man. He opens the windows and he begins to pray. Now follow this. His prayer is persistent. Again, here's this thing on prayer. His prayer is persistent in verse 10. It says that he prays there three times a day. You know what that means? That means first thing in the morning, that means at midday, at noon, and that means at night. So he was persistent in his prayer, but he was also a man that was very reverent in his prayer because he knew that when he began to pray that he was literally entering into the throne room of the almighty creator of the universe because the Bible says in verse 10, he gets down on his knees and prays. Now, now kneeling, it speaks of humility. And kneeling, it speaks of utter dependence. And I know some of you can't physically kneel when you come and pray. Man, God knows that, okay? Don't, don't sit here and say that Pastor Danny says you have to do that. But you can respond, and you can kneel in your heart. Because, listen, it speaks of, but if you can kneel, kneel. But don't, don't let the devil beat you up because you can. I'm just telling you, kneeling is important. You know what it is? It speaks of utter dependence. Lord, I can't handle this situation. And kneeling, listen, it's an act of surrender. It's an act of surrender. Did you know back in these days that, that enemies demanded that, that they would come and, and kneel before their conquerors? And so when a man and a woman prays and you're kneeling, you're saying, God, I surrender all. I surrender my heart to you. But, but notice something else here about he prays. Not only does he pray reverently, but he prays expectantly. Now, the Bible says his windows, now get this, this is so good. The Bible says his windows are open to Jerusalem. Now, you might think, okay, yeah, he's publicly professing his faith. What, such boldness, right? Which, which, that's all true. I mean, the boldness of Daniel. You want to learn how to live in this 21st century for God? Look at this guy. You can't say anything about God. Eh, I'm opening the windows, man. I'm praying to my God. Everybody take a look. That's bold. But let me tell you why he did that. You see... Understand that the temple, temple had been destroyed, right? Babylon came and destroyed it. All the holy vessels were carried off into ancient Babylon. He was part of that when all that was going on. Listen, he saw Jerusalem burn to the ground. Daniel did. But, but God had made a promise to him. Amen. What was the promise? You're going back. You're going back to Jerusalem. You're going back to that place. You're going to rebuild those walls of that temple. You know what he's doing, guys, when he's praying here? He's not walking by sight. He's walking by faith. Because God's already said, hey, listen, that, that, he's already told them that in exile, it's going to end. A remnant will return, and the temple is going to be rebuilt. And so when he's praying there, facing Jerusalem, you know what he's doing? He's praying and standing on the promises of God. I believe one day I'm coming back. I believe one day that the walls are going to be rebuilt. I believe one day that God says it so that the temple's going to be rebuilt. I'm facing Jerusalem because God says it's going to happen just like he said it was going to happen. And I'm going to believe what God says even though I can't see it. I'm going to believe it because God says it's so. Wow. What a spiritual giant. He prayed expectantly. 
and he prayed cheerfully. Cheerfully. No, not, oh, woe is me. Notice, the Bible says at the end of verse 10 that he gives thanks. He gives thanks. Now, now get this. He's getting ready to get thrown in the den with the lions. Hello? He's getting ready to get put in a lion's den. But he's giving thanks. Folks, listen. We give thanks and we're grateful to God, not because we feel like it, but because God expects it. And God wants us to. And, and, And listen, our gratification is really an anticipation that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. So he goes into the lion's den, and we'll get into that in the next message. But you've got to understand, he goes into that lion's den with praise in his mouth and a joyful heart. He goes into that lion's den with thanksgiving in his heart, worshiping God Almighty. Cheerfully, he prays. And then finally, he prays passionately. I mean, verse 11, you read that verse. It talks about supplication. In the King James, it says that. He says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Some, some translate that. When you look at that word, it means to, that word supplication means to show and, and implore favor. To implore favor. So, so, so let, let me tell you, there's two words in the Bible that really help us with prayer. One is prayer. We read that. And then the other one is supplication. And prayer is simply this. It's just a general definition of us having all kinds of conversation with God. But supplication, when you look at that, again, it means to show or to implore favor. Supplication is praying with a burden for a specific need. That's what that definition of supplication is. Lord, implore favor. He's pleading here. That's supplication, guys. He has a need. God, I'm fixing to face the lions. But Lord, I'm not compromising. You know why, God? Because you're not finished with me yet. Lord, the temple's going to be rebuilt. You've got a plan for my life. Lord, I'm not going to be controlled by my circumstances. No, Lord, I'm not going to let them control me. Lord, I'm going to live beyond my circumstances because I've got a God who is the Lord of all my circumstances. So Lord, I, I implore your favor on my life I'm pleading with supplication about this need and I'm asking you God to move in it even though I'm not going to be overcome by those circumstances I'm going to live on top of my circumstances because you're God friend you got a need today you got some supplication you need to bring before the Lord today man I'm going to I'm going to encourage you man come and pray to him today ask him implore his favor God, give me your favor. God, show me your promises. God, come through like you say you're going to come through. Lord, I'm going to still serve you no matter what happens, but oh God, implore your favor. That's what that means. Wow. A spiritual giant. Daniel was a spiritual giant. You know, you don't have to be a superman to be a giant. Did you know that? And, and you know, I'll say this, you don't have to be perfect to be a giant. I mean, Daniel wasn't a perfect man. This, this is what it means to be a giant. There was a, a great man many years ago that was called J. Hudson Taylor. And J. Hudson Taylor, who through faith, basically founded the China Inland Missions. And, and this is what he said to describe spiritual giants, about God's giants. Here's what he said. He said, all giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on His power and His presence being with them. Friend, you can become a spiritual giant if you will reckon on God's power and God's presence to be with you. Listen, America desperately needs some spiritual giants i'm not talking about believers america needs those too absolutely america needs some spiritual giants not just people that are saved and say they're born again and they come and they just go through the motions we need people number one that are an influence for god people that 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 god is on them so much Because they've got an excellent spirit. They've got a spirit. 
that's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You're a person that, that, that walks in the Spirit. you got an excellent Spirit. You're not a griper. You're not a complainer. You're not negative. You're not always criticizing things. You're just, you got an excellent spirit, man. And, and you, may, you not, uh, might not always agree with everything, but you know what? You're going to go on, and, and you're not going to cause havoc for the church staff, and you're not going to cause havoc for, for the pastor or the children's director or the student pastor or the executive pastor. You say, man, what's going on here? I'm just preaching, man. I don't know. I, I'm just saying God just wanted me to say that. I'm just saying, and I don't say this about your job, about where you are, your lot in life. Have an excellent spirit. You wear people out when you don't. You're no fun to be around. You're not a delight. I know it's tough. I know you don't always get what you want. I, I know you would like things to be a certain way. But instead of stirring up strife with your mouth and, and talking stuff, just have an excellent spirit. And God will employ his favor on you, man. Listen, God needs somebody with character. Not, not just what you do in public, but what do you do in private? Will it invite the devil to throw some junk on you? Yeah. Bring it on, big boy. Bring it on. Because I've got a God who's powerful. And he broke your power the day Jesus Christ died on a cross. It's all good, man. I'm going to keep on plowing through no matter what the devil throws in my life. Because I'm going to have character. I'm going to be somebody publicly, but privately, I'm going to be somebody that lives for Jesus. And most of all, I'm going to have some power. Amen. How do I get it? i got to get in the prayer closet. And i got to follow this pattern right here. And I need to ask God to bestow His power upon my life. Dunamis. We don't need puny Christians. We need powerful Christians. Now let me say this. I'm done. Listen, listen, this is important, man. All these character traits that I just gave you, all these awesome things that I gave you about being a spiritual giant, listen, you can't get any of those things in your life until you get saved. See, some of you are going about it backwards, all right? You're, you're, you're trying to be a person of influence. Oh, I need to live for Jesus. But you know what? You've never really surrendered and been saved. Wait, Brother Danny, I, don't you see? My card is still a copy in the, in the church secretary's office. I mean, we've got a, we've got my, my name should be on file. I was baptized on that. Well, okay, great. Awesome. I'm happy for you if you've been saved. I'm not asking you if you've got a card or you're a member of the church or you're made a profession. I'm asking you, man, have you been saved? Have you been born of God? Have you had that true encounter one day with Jesus Christ where you surrendered your life to Him, man? Quit the head knowledge stuff. Get the heart knowledge. Quit living on your own beliefs and believing in your head and come to that place of surrender to Jesus as your Lord and your Master. That's the only way you're going to get saved. You can't be a person of influence unless you've done that. You can't be a person of character. I mean, there's a lot of good people in this world, and, and they have a good character, but, but, and they try to do the best they can, but eventually, that good is no good. Does that make sense? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners to the core, desperately wicked, separated from Jesus Christ because we're born with a nature to sin against God. And the judgment of God is upon us if we don't get saved. You can't be a person of character until you have Jesus in you. And then when Jesus gets in you, then what's going to happen? He's going to come out. And you're going to see that character, even in private. And, and listen, you can't have any power unless you get saved. Okay, that's a no-brainer. I want to be a powerful Christian. I want to be one who loves the Lord. I want to be one who, man, that, that God sees People see God's power. Well, great, awesome, but you got to get saved. There's so many people today, they're doing it backwards. They've never truly trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I'm just saying, man, you can't have any power until you get the ultimate power in you. 
And then the Holy Spirit, who's the power of God, will begin to manifest Jesus out on other people. So here's the question today. I guess, number one, are you saved? I mean, this is a message to Christians, but I'm just feeling geared to kind of go in another direction, too. Are you saved? Do you know that you know? Well, you sure say that a lot, don't you, Pastor? Yeah, because I was one one time. I preached on Judas Iscariot Wednesday night. You ought to listen to the message, those of you that, you know, were serving in other areas around here. But, man, what a sad story. What was Judas's problem? He had religion. I mean, Judas Iscariot, I'm going to preach this message to y'all again, okay, real quick. Judas Iscariot, yeah, oh well, we're running past time. Judas Iscariot was a man that evidently made a profession of faith. I mean, because when you see all the disciples, all the disciples, I mean, they were summoned by Jesus, right? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So they had to give up their nets, they had to give up their tax collecting business, whatever it was, and they began to follow Jesus. I mean, there's no, there's no evidence that Judas did anything different. I mean, everybody was summoned by Jesus, so he made a profession of faith, I believe. I mean, but then he also had this public reputation. I mean, he was a holy guy, man. Oh, he ran with the disciples. He was one right next to Jesus. He saw the miracles of Jesus. He saw Jesus raise the dead, man. But he was lost. The Bible says that Satan lived in him. You can't, listen, a person that's, that's saved cannot be demon-possessed. You can be demon-harassed, but not possessed. And, and, and there's so much evidence. He was a thief. He was stealing money out of the money bag. And how did Jews at Judas die? The saddest story in the Bible. It's a pitiful man. Hung himself. Threw down those pieces of silver. And he had remorse, but he had no repentance. It's a big difference from having remorse. See, there's a lot of people today going to hell because they were remorseful. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry I got this, this problem that I've got. Oh, I'm just remorseful. Oh, I, I, man, if I can get out of trouble, man, pastor, if, man, listen, my wife left me. If I can just make this decision and say I'm going to get saved, then maybe she'll come back to me. Or my husband left me. Or, or I've cheated on my husband. And, and man, I'll make this profession of faith. If I can just do that, he'll come back. Or, 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 or maybe, oh, my goodness, man, I've been busted for drugs. And, man, I want to get saved. And if I get saved, then, then maybe the judge will let me off the hook. I'm remorseful but I'm not really willing to repent. And that's what separates people from heaven to hell. It's not about remorse. It's about repentance. He was remorseful, threw down the pieces of silver, but there's no evidence that his life was changed. And he hung himself. And it's the saddest story. He hung himself. And his, and his body began to decompose. This is gross. But that bloated body began to decompose. And the weight of that body, of all that, that junk that bloated up, Evidently, the rope snapped and his body hit the ground. And they say his intestines gushed out. Now you're going, man, I want to eat lunch today. What, what are you telling me about? I'm just saying it's in the Bible. Acts chapter 118, you read it, all right? That's what happened. That's the saddest story in the Bible. And you say, why does God give us those details so gory about him on how he died? Because I believe God wants us to see how a life ends of a man that betrayed the Lord. A sad story and people that don't know the Lord today that have religion but no relationship you're gonna have a sad story you might not end that way but when you die without Christ the saddest thing in all the world is to go to hell for all eternity father we come to you today we give you this invitation time to work in people's lives right now Hey, folks, we just wanted to Lord, thank you so you. much for tuning in with us this morning online. It was a blessing to have you with us. Uh, we hope that the Word of God was able to be a minister to you and be able to breathe life into your soul. I, I do want you to know that if uh, you personally invited Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior today online, man, we would love to help you with that. Minister to you any way we can. We would love to do that. And so we know that, you know, really the Bible tells us really the next step of obedience is just to make our decision public the best way we know how. So here's what we would like to encourage you to do. Uh, you'll see on the screen, uh, there's a couple of ways you can contact us. First of all, you can call us at 405 677 0591 405 677 0591 or 
If you want to email us, you can email us at prayeratthelane.tv. Uh, we've got somebody actually by the phone right now that's waiting. So if you'll call us, just say, hey, listen, I've invited Christ into my heart. We've actually got some material for you to help you, some Bible studies to help you as you walk with the Lord. And then let me say this, maybe, maybe you just need some prayer today. We would love to pray with you and minister to you any way we can. So we've got somebody waiting by the phone to do that also. So man, just call us at that phone number or email us. We'd love to minister with you. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. And we praise the Lord for this opportunity to serve you. God bless you. Have a great day.